Hi. Today I want to talk a little bit about current. Chapter 22 is all about current, and current is charges in motion. So far we've been talking about stationary charges or electrostatics, but now I want to talk about charges in motion, and current is what we call charges in motion. Here we see my light bulb and some batteries, and you see my multimeter here is set up to measure current. It is reading zero right now because there is no current flowing through it. There are no charges flowing through this device right now. These batteries each put out about 1.5 volts. We saw that in the previous chapter. And they put that out whether they're hooked up to a device or not. So right this second, they're putting out 1.5 volts. They're at 1.5 volts, but no current is flowing because I don't have a complete circuit. As soon as I touch this, we see that the light bulb lights up. We have a complete circuit and current is flowing. And we see here we've got about 170 milliamps flowing. That is set on milliamps. So we've got about 170 milliamps flowing. Now this is an example of a DC or directional current. The current always flows in the same direction. It flows from the positive side of the battery through the multimeter, through the light bulb, and back into the negative side of the battery. And it always flows in the same direction. That's a DC circuit. That's what we're going to focus on now. Uh, an AC circuit can also exist. It turns out that's what's uh, AC electricity is what comes out of your wall. I'll show you one of those in just a second. So now I have switched out my light bulbs for a saw. And the saw is plugged into my wall. I've got it plugged into an extension cord here. And I've got this AC current meter, AC current meter, ammeter. I've got this AC ammeter hooked up. And maybe we can measure what the current is on this. Let's see if I can get it to where you can see without the reflection. There we go. That's pretty good. And here we go. We'll turn on the saw. Let's see what happens. Not surprisingly, we get no current with the saw off and we get a uh, large current with the saw on. So this is an example of alternating current. And in this case, the current flows first one way and then the other and then the other and then the other and then the other. It does that 60 times a second. We'll talk more about that in a couple chapters. For right now, our focus will be on DC or direct current. So what is current? Chapter 22 is all about current and resistance. And resistance is one of those things in physics that actually has a really nice name. Resistance is an, a measure of an object's resistance to the flow of electricity. So it's a nice description there. But we've learned in the previous chapters that charge is carried on electrons and protons, these subatomic particles that are too small to see. So we can't just look at a movie of current flowing through some wire or something. We have to develop a model to help us wrap our brains around it. And so that's what we're going to talk about here is what is a good model for current? How can we wrap our brains around what's happening when charge is flowing through a wire? So we've talked quite a bit about parallel plate capacitors, right? And a parallel plate capacitor is a device that can store charge, it creates a uniform electric field, and it can store energy. So let's think about it in its uh, storing charge capacity. Yeah. Uh, so here we've got a capacitor, and uh, this plate here is positive, and this plate is negative. And what we could do is we could connect a wire between the two plates, and it would cause the capacitor to discharge or to lose its charge. The negative charges would flow off of this plate and flow over here to uh, neutralize the, the positives over here. And so eventually, we'd end up with both plates being neutral. Uh, we'd say that, that the parallel plate capacitor would be discharged. Now, we can make some observations about what happens in that wire while this is happening. For example, we will notice that the wire will get hot. When you run a current through a wire, it heats up. This is just one of the properties of real wires. You may have noticed this before. Um, you know, I know when I run my vacuum cleaner and I go unplug it from the wall, when I grab the plug out of the wall, it's often quite warm if I've been running the vacuum for a while. Why? Because current ran through it and generated some heat. Um, a toaster is just a wire that you run a current through and the wire gets hot and it turns your bread into toast. Mmm. So, you've had experience with this. It's just something we observe when a current flows through a wire. We observe that the wire gets warm. We could run this current through a uh, light bulb 
and do something useful with that, right? It turns out that an old school filament light bulb is just a very narrow piece of wire. And when you run current through it, it gets warm. In fact, it gets so warm, it glows and puts off enough light that you can read a book or do something useful with it. So we see here that a current can be run through a light bulb and cause the light bulb to get so hot it will glow. And we can sort of use this idea of how bright the light bulb is as a bit of a proxy for how much current there is, because more current will lead to a brighter bulb. Um, as the current discharges, or excuse me, as the capacitor discharges, the current carrying wire will deflect a compass. That's a very interesting observation here. Apparently, electrical currents have something to do with magnetic fields that's a property we'll investigate more in a couple of chapters. So, you know, if I was to run a, uh, a current through this wire, here, here I have a wire here, and I know you've all seen wires before, but this is a nice thick uh, copper wire that I have here. And this right here is a nice thick aluminum wire that I have. Uh, and these are both nice conductors. Aluminum and copper are both really good conductors of electricity. Um, typical wiring in household is copper prior to about 1977. A lot of inside household wiring was aluminum, but uh, there are various reasons why copper is a little bit safer. Um, so if we were to think about what would be happening if we ran a current through here, well, in order to understand that, we need to remember what makes a metal a metal. Well, what makes a metal a metal is the fact that it, it forms this crystal lattice, right? So there's these regularly arranged aluminum atoms within this wire of aluminum. And, and it forms this regular pattern, a crystal shape. And um, that's where the atoms live. But each atom contributes one, two, three, uh, or so conduction electrons. And those conduction electrons are not bound to an individual atom. Those conduction electrons can move freely throughout the wire, almost in the similar way as a nitrogen atom in this room in my basement can move freely around. It might bounce off the wall. It might bounce off my face. It, uh, but it, can, it might bounce off another molecule. But basically, it can move freely and it, until it runs into something and bounces off. In a similar way, the electrons inside this piece of metal can move around freely until they run into, oh, one of the aluminum atoms, uh, the wall of the wire, another electron. They'll have these collisions, but otherwise, they're free to move within the wire. We call those the conduction electrons. And way back in Physics 1, we also learned that metals are good conductors of heat. And so not only can those electrons carry charge, the flow of charge is a current, they can also carry kinetic energy. And so a metal is a good conductor of electricity, and it's a good conductor of heat, and it's for the same reasons. So inside here, there are these electrons that are free to move. If I was hook to hook this wire up to a battery, then it would provide a force on those electrons, which would cause them to move more in one direction than in another. If we applied a, a battery would create an electric field in this wire, which would create a force on those electrons. So looking at this picture, <clears throat> we see that the path of an electron might be kind of random. It's all kind of a little bit all over the place. And why is it like that? Well, remember that the electrons inside this wire are not at absolute zero. And as we've learned, anything that is not at absolute zero is moving. In fact, it's probably moving quite quickly. So right now, with no current moving through this wire, the electrons in this wire are bouncing all over the place in there. If I apply an electric field across the wire, then they'll be bouncing all over the place, but with some sort of net motion. And don't forget this equation right here. F equals Q times E, right? And since electrons are negative, the force on the electron is in the opposite direction from the electric field. The force and the electric field are opposite because Q is negative. So looking back at this picture that we have here, um, we see that there is a force to the right on these electrons, but they're also moving around randomly. And so you know what? We actually end up with these nice parabolic shapes. It's a parabolic trajectory. But notice that there is a net motion to the right. We call that its drift velocity. And it turns out that its drift velocity is much smaller than its thermal velocity. Um, its thermal velocity would be on the order of a thousand miles an hour, something like that. 
quite fast. Um, whereas the drift velocity is on the order of centimeters per second. Very slow. So it's kind of interesting to think about. Okay, so it's a potential difference that creates the electric field that drives the current. So we've said hey, we got to have an electric field to create a force on these electrons to move them, to create a current. Well, what creates that electric field? A potential difference. So if we've got our positive plate of our, of our capacitor here and our negative plate right here, then this is our high potential, this is our low potential. That will drive a current from high to low. Um, again, we know that it is electrons that are actually moving. More on that in just one second. Uh, we know that it's the electrons that are actually moving. They're moving opposite the direction of the electric field. So it is, but it's the potential difference that creates that electric field. Now we have to be a little bit careful here. Um, it turns out that the person who defined positive and negative, the person who decided that an electron was going to be called a negative, somebody decided that, right? That person was Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said, hey, when I rub a piece of glass with wool, I'm going to call the charge that develops on that glass, I'm going to call that positive. Great. Makes perfect sense. The problem is, this was right around the year 1800. We're talking about 100 years before the discovery of the electron. 110, 15 years before the atomic model. So Benjamin Franklin is deciding what's positive and what's negative before they've even been discovered. Oh, that's weird. So it turns out that it was sort of an unfortunate decision because it turns out that it is, according to his definition, it is negative charges that move. You know, if he had just made the opposite decision, had he said, hey, you know, when I rub glass with a piece of wool, I'm going to call that mm, negative. Oh, then guess what? Our electrons would be called positive. They would go in the same direction as current, and all beginning physics students would be super stoked. But Ben did not make that decision. He called glass positive, and we are stuck with that definition to this day. And um, so we see here that we have the definition of current as going from positive to negative. But we know that what's really moving in a metal is negative charges. Negative charges moving on electrons from the negative plate to the positive plate. <clears throat> now, at first, this seems a little bit weird. And you, and you might think, well, how did Benjamin Franklin, why did he do that, right? But, but if you think about it from a zoomed out perspective, if all we care about is light bulbs and batteries and does our wire get warm, we actually don't care if it's a positive charge going this way or a negative charge going that way. We don't care at all. It, from the macroscopic zoomed out view, there is no difference between those two models. Now, if we zoom in and we see, oh, actually, if I define a current going this way, there's really electrons going that way. Yeah, that's okay too, right? It really is perfectly logical. It's like, you know, if, if I wanted to get $10 richer, well, I could go out and I could work and I could earn $10, right? So then I just, I just got positive $10. But, if I had a $10 debt and I gave it to you, here you go, here's my $10 debt. Didn't I just get richer, right? I got richer by giving you something, right? I gave you negative money that made me richer and you poorer, right? It's the same as you giving me a $10 bill, me giving you a $10 debt is exactly the same, right? So again, we can think about negatives moving this way or positives moving this way. It really doesn't matter. You know, um, electrical engineers who dig into this stuff way deeper than we will than I ever have. Electrical engineers sometimes talk about holes. And what is a hole? A hole is a place where an electron used to be. So we can have holes going this way and electrons going that way. Well, we're not going to get quite into it that far. But it works perfectly well. So as long as we just kind of remember this, the current flows one way and it is opposite the flow of electrons. <clears throat> Thank you, Ben Franklin. Now, this is just in a metal, right? In a metal, the electrons are always the charge carrier. Um, in a electrolyte solution, uh, you have positives and negatives. So in, in salt water, for example, salt water, very salty water is a pretty good conductor of electricity. And in salt water, it's sodium and chlorine uh, ions that are the charge carriers. So you have positive and negative charge carriers. And then it's not confusing, right? And so it's really just this convention that Ben stuck us with that gets a little weird in a metal, because in a metal, the charge carriers are always negative. Okay, so what else can we observe? Again, we're going through this list of observations when we discharge a capacitor through a wire. So first of all, we'll find that the current 
at point A is exactly the same as the current at point B. Now, a lot of people have this idea that a light bulb somehow uses up electrons, or it, it uses up that current. It doesn't, right? What it does is it uses up the energy of the electrons. It converts the electrical potential energy of the electrons into light and heat, which is what the point of the light bulb is. It doesn't use up the electrons. We have to remember our charge model. The electrons carry the charge, right? Charge is carried on a physical object. And that physical object can't just disappear, right? If you've told me an electron disappeared in that light bulb, then you have to tell me where it went. They don't just disappear. Protons don't just disappear. Electrons don't just disappear in our light bulb. So for every electron that goes in, there's another electron that goes out. Now, the electron that goes out will have less potential energy than the electron that went in. So we're using up something. Your intuition isn't wrong. It's just that the thing we're using up is energy, not charge or current. So this is a big idea. The big idea is conservation of charge. Charge doesn't just disappear. It's carried on a physical object, protons, electrons. Therefore, it doesn't just disappear. Um, I've, I've been building up this analogy with, with uh, height, right? So potential is like height in our electrical landscape. And similarly, um, as the electrons move, they lose potential energy. And we can imagine water moving from high to low in a similar way. Water, as it moves from a dam to below the dam, loses potential energy. If you want to, you can run it through a turbine and create electrical energy. Now, if we look at this turbine picture here, right, every gallon of water that comes in also has to leave, right? This turbine isn't using up water. In a similar way, this light bulb is not using up charge, right? So in the same way that the water flows through the turbine, the charge flows through the light bulb. We have exactly the same amount entering as we have leaving. This is the law of conservation of current. The current is the same at all points along a current carrying wire. So here's a quick example. Uh, the discharge of a capacitor lights two identical bulbs. Which bulb is brighter? And remember, we're kind of using brightness as a proxy for current. So this is another way of saying, how does the current in bulb one compare to the current in bulb two? Why don't you think about it and pause the video and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so recall that current is carried on physical objects. They don't just disappear. So for every electron that goes through bulb one, an electron goes through bulb two. There's the exact same current in both of these bulbs because of the conservation of current. If there's the same current and the bulbs are identical, then we should have the exact same brightness. And indeed we do. So how do we define current? Well, we just need to measure the amount of charge that passes through a cross-section of a wire in some time interval t. So we just count how much charge passes through this little window right here in an amount of time t, and then that gives us the current. So the current is change in charge over change in time. But specifically, what do I mean by change in charge? We mean how much charge flows through some area that's perpendicular to that wire. So for example, uh, we could take a little slice through the middle here. We could count charge that flows through that slice in a given second, and that would be how much current is flowing in my wire. And the unit is the amp here. One amp, that is one coulomb per second. Um, you know, as we saw earlier, my saw pulled, what, between two and three amps? It was a little bit inconsistent, wasn't it? Um, between two and three amps. Um, so one amp is a fairly normal sort of household size unit of uh, current. A 100 watt light bulb pulls about one amp. Um, an amp would be a lot for a small device, though. Uh, small devices like your cell phone or a calculator are probably running on micro or milliamps. Uh, what do we see? 170 milliamps running through that light bulb at the beginning of this lecture. So here's a quick example. Every minute, 120 coulombs of charge flows through this cross-section of wire. Uh, what's the wire's current? You have to do some quick math. I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so we're going to have to do some quick math here. We know the current is 
delta Q over delta T. And in this case, it tells us that we've got 120 coulombs um, in one minute. And so if we want standard units out, we always put standard units in. Therefore, this should be 60 seconds. And we end up with a current of 2 amps or 2 amperes. PowerPoint agrees. Woohoo! So, I want to talk about one more application of the law of conservation of current. And um, for this, though, I'm going to talk about a different conservation. I want to talk about the conservation of yogurt. So I went down to, uh, we've got the Morning Fresh Dairy here in C, uh, here at uh, Fort Collins. It's out north of town there. And um, they make Noosa yogurt um, out there, which is extremely delicious. And at, uh, at one point in their factory there, they've got this big pipe here. And um, in this big pipe, uh, there's uh, 10 gallons per minute of yogurt that flows in this big pipe. And it's going in this direction. And then it splits. And um, this part right here, that's going to go over and make pumpkin yogurt. And uh, it turns out that that's not their most popular flavor. Only two gallons per minute flow over there. Okay. Okay. And then so over here, uh, this, this is going over to get my strawberry yogurt. And my question for you is, we've got 10 gallons per minute coming in. We've got two gallons per minute going out over there. How much yogurt every minute is going to the strawberry part of the factory? Well, hopefully this is pretty straightforward. It's just 10 minus 2, right? We've got to have 8. Right? Because we've got to have as much yogurt going out of this junction as we have going into it, unless we have a cow or a hungry toddler hanging out right here. right? We've got to have the same amount coming in as going out. This is the law of conservation of yogurt. It's not too bad. We can do the same thing for conservation of current. And it's really just as straightforward. It's just when I start talking about current, it seems trickier than when I talk about yogurt. Because the units are different. I don't know, it's just a trickier idea. But we have the junction rule, which is just the law of conservation of current applied to a junction, right? So we know that the total current coming into the junction has to equal the total current coming out of the junction. And that's exactly what this says. The total current coming in is the total current coming out. And to make it trickier, we just, it has sort of a funny name. It's Kirchhoff's Junction Law. It's just the conservation of stuff. Because remember, charge is carried on a physical object. It's just the conservation of stuff. And, uh, you know, in your book, you might see it written like this. Sometimes people get a little freaked out by the summation symbol. That just means the total of all the currents in equals the total of all the currents out. It's the same as this. It's a fairly straightforward idea. Um, sometimes it's tricky to remember to use it because it's so straightforward. But let's do a quick example here. Um, we've got this junction set up. We've got 2 amps coming in here, 5 amps coming in from the top, 9 amps going out from the bottom. What is the current and in what direction in this fourth wire? Is it 16 amps to the right, 4 amps to the left, 2 amps to the right, 2 amps to the left, or do we not have enough information? Why don't you pause the video, give it a shot, and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, well, let's look at what we've got drawn here. Um, what's our total in? Well, as drawn, we only have 5 plus 2 equals 7 in. Uh, but we have 9 out, right? So right now, as drawn, we have 7 in and 9 out. That doesn't work. We must need another 2 in because we need to have 9 in and 9 out. So 5 plus 2, this must have to be 2 also. Now we have 7 amps in, 7 amps out. Yay. That is the conservation of